MusiCodes is a prototype system that enables musicians to compose and perform musical codes that act as triggers for media interactions in their live performance settings. Musical codes, what these are, are effectively a series of notes and or rhythms that form part of the music of a musical work that they may, may be playing in a concert situation. Simply, the system contains an experience, an authoring editor, and a performance environment. The authoring editor finds the uh, performer, the musician, predefining the codes that they're going to play. Then they map actions against these codes, and actions are expressed via a range of communication protocols, such as MIDI or open sound control messages, or, or calling URLs. And these are connected to a range of other software or hardware systems that make up the performance uh, configuration. When in performance mode, the system takes a MIDI and or an audio input. The audio input is processed through a feature extraction plugin, which extracts the pitch, the delays between note onsets, and velocity information. And this input stream is continuously compared against the predefined candidate codes. And when a code is matched, the um, mapped action is then initiated, which may trigger a backing track, a musical sample, a projection, or a lighting cue, or some other media interaction that's part of the performance setup. Codes are represented textually, either as note names, note names with octave positions, delays between note onsets, or a combination of both. But we didn't leave it there. We also introduced regular expressions into the composition of codes. Now, regular expressions are commonplace for computer scientists, but much less so for musicians. Even so, we thought they were a useful means of composing codes that had some inbuilt flexibility. Common regular expression characters are the wild card or the multiple wild card. And what this means in the case of our example here is you could replace a specific pitch, for example, with the wild card character, the dot. That means a performer could play any pitch at that point in the sequence. Or if you use the multiple wild cards, you could play any number of any pitches at that point in the sequence which would mean that a performer could improvise or embellish around a basic code and it still be matched by the system. Regular expressions also allow for ranges, for alternatives, for groups and repetitions and all sorts of um, different code configurations. In this very simple example, you see the performance view, the incoming note stream on the top, there's one single candidate code on the left-hand side, and as notes are matched, they are highlighted in red, giving feedback to the performer. In this instance, when the code is matched, it triggers a backing track that the keyboard player plays along with. So that's a bit of background about the um, music code system. The paper charts an exploratory process of us iteratively developing the MusiCodes software in response to emerging requirements from users via a series of workshops. And through these, we've learned some deeper principles about how human performers interact with the system. There was some previous development work on music codes that wasn't evaluated with um, performers, but the paper picks up at the point that we refer to as version one. And we deployed this at two workshops um, and then re-engineered the system in response to the requirements and the thoughts that came out of these two workshops and produced version two, which was then deployed at a second series of two workshops. The workshops engaged with 23 participants that included a range of professional, pro-am and amateur musicians who brought along with them a range of acoustic and electric instruments. Each workshop lasted approximately three to five hours and followed a similar structure, which was setting up their instruments, installing the software onto their laptops. Then we guided them through a tutorial of the functionality of the music code system. And then there was an extended period of self-exploration with facilitated su support. Finally, there was an opportunity for them to show and tell, to feedback what they had done with the system and to discuss their experience of using it. I'm just gonna give a very quick skim through some of the findings that came out of these workshops. And these are presented under a, um, a series of headings that basically represent the workflow of using the music code system, in that you compose codes, you then set up the system for use, 
I'm not going to cover rigging the system here. This refers to how you configure music codes within a much larger performance ecology in an, a live performance setting, which wasn't part of our workshop. Then we're going to look at how people performed the codes and how they captured and analyzed their performances. So the majority of participants worked with pitch-based codes. Some made short codes of just a few notes, some made longer codes. Um, some made them octave independent, some used specific octave positions. And they found that these made the codes looser or tighter. For example, there was one participant who was playing a tin whistle um, into a microphone plugged into the system. And they found that the ambient noise in the room was compromising the system. It was stopping the system from recognizing and matching the codes they were trying to play. So they found that by specifying an octave position which was suitable for their instrument, the tin whistle, which was quite a high pitch range, this naturally filtered out the majority of the ambient sound in the room, making the system much tighter and enabled them to perform and match their codes quite effectively. Nine participants worked with regular expressions in the composition of their codes, and these were pretty much the computer scientists in the group. The musicians, we have to admit, struggled within the bounds of the workshop to incorporate this into their code composition. Um, and there's a bit of a job of work to be done there about how, how best we can maybe hide regular expressions within the system, um, which I'll come back to in a, a little bit later. As well as using regular expressions to make the codes flexible, they also used them to overcome challenges in system recognition. So one example was a guitar player who had composed a code and defined it in the system, but there was a specific note that the feature extraction plugin was struggling to recognize. So rather than having that specific pitch, they replaced it with the wildcard character of the regular expression, which meant that that pitch would be matched every time he played it. So therefore, he made the code looser and easier to, to match. It became obvious in version one that it would be very useful to have codes only available to be matched and actioned at certain points in the performance of a musical work. So in the second version that we deployed in workshops uh, three and four, we introduced a set of logical preconditions. So these were conditions that you could assign to a code for when they become available to be matched. Um, an example would be a count. So if you were playing a riff or an ostinato, ostinato pattern that you wanted to be a code, you could say, the first seven times I play this code, it will be ignored. But on the eighth time, it's available to be matched and actioned. Moving on to setting up the system. 11 participants were working with a MIDI input, and this gave a very clean input into the system. What they played, the system heard. But the 14 participants working with an audio input, the majority of those found that there are an awful lot of undesirable artifacts that bled into the system as a result of ambient noise in the room, um, some attributes of the instrument or the way they were playing it, or the way that the feature extraction plugin in the system uh, performed. And these participants spent a great deal of time trying to tune their composition of codes and the way they played their instrument to reduce the degree of artifacts. Picking up on this, in the second version we deployed um, in workshops three and four, we introduced a set of filtering options. So you could filter out incoming note events based on their velocity or pitch range. So in workshop three, there was an example of a participant who was playing an acoustic bass guitar. Um, which is a very problematic instrument to use in a music recognition setting. Um, and they, they used a velocity threshold to filter out what was handling noise of their fingers on the strings of the instrument. And they also used a high pitch range threshold to filter out what were the harmonic overtones that were resonating in, along with the fundamentals, the notes they were playing for their musical code. And by telling the system to ignore these incoming attributes, they were able to perform far looser with the system. Other things that came up in a performance setting was that the participants relied very heavily on the visual feedback from the performance view. Um, that they wanted to see which notes were coming into the system, they wanted to see um, how their codes were being 
um, recognised by the system. As I mentioned earlier, um, characters in the codes are highlighted red when matched. So this gives you feedback, but you've also got some feed forward here in being able to see which characters are left to be matched. And they've relied quite heavily on this. In the second version that we used in workshops three and four, we in introduced a range of inexact matching um, parameters. So this we, these were user-definable, which means that the user could set a degree of error for how well they could perform the codes and then still be matched by the system. So this was direct control over the looseness or the tightness of the system. In the first set of workshops with iteration one, um, many of the participants um, weren't happy at composing codes textually by inputting them as notes and rhythms and so on. Um, and they asked that it would be really useful if they could perform in their codes, if they could play them into the system. So we introduced this into um, the second version. So you could record in your codes, this would automatically generate the textual representation that the system required, and then you could play with the filtering um, settings, which would dynamically show how your code would respond. So this also enabled musicians to perform in multiple instances of the same code and to see where the problem areas were, where the challenges were, where they needed to maybe tune their performance or maybe look at the composition of the code or at the configuration of the system in order to fine tune something that was effective when, they, when the time comes to perform it. So what emerged from these set of workshops is this sort of concept of looseness between human performer and system. And we highlight in the paper three aspects of looseness. The negotiation of control, feedback and feed forward, and a process of gradual attunement. So this shows a set of relationships between the human performance system based on this sort of looseness tightness um, spectrum. So, for example, in the bottom left-hand side, if you set up the system tightly by composing long codes and expect exact um, matching and maybe no pre-filtering, this in turn requires the performer to perform very tightly with the system, to play to a fixed tempo, to reduce the amount of expression they use, um, and maybe play in an undesirable way. On the other hand, if you set up the system loosely, by composing short codes that um, have set inexact matching and maybe used regular expressions. This in turn allows the performer to play very loosely with the, with the system. They can improvise, they can embellish, um, they can play with different fields, and the system will still recognize and match their codes, but at the risk of many false positives. So we address this to a degree with the use of the logical preconditions by only making loose codes available at certain points within the musical work when you want them, so you don't trigger them accidentally at other points when you, they're not required. As I said before, feedback and feed forward was very important in the performance situation, but also it was very important in the process of authoring and composing the codes. Um, in understanding how your instrument performs with the system, in understanding how the codes you choose to compose perform with the system, but also in understanding how, when you configure the system, how that works against your incoming performance. Um, but turning the attention back to the performance mode, we've got a bit of a job here, I think, as a piece of a future work. Um, for example, this shows the performance view Lots of, lots of lovely information there to look at. However, if next week I'm performing at Red Rocks Amphitheatre, I don't particularly want to be trying to make sense of a screen like this in a live performance setting. So we've got a piece of future work here to try and understand what kind of channels or mechanisms can we use to successfully give appropriate feed forward and feedback to the performer that would work in a performance setting. Looseness is negotiated over time. We found that there were multiple feedback loops between performer and the system at every step along the workflow of authoring, composing, and performing with the system.
and this is something that is gradually refined and configured. Also, we think that there's a need for an a notation of system states that is human writable and readable and also appropriate musically, particularly if you've got multiple stakeholders involved, if you've got someone that's composing or authoring the system and a different person performing with the system, they need to understand how it's been configured and what's required of their performance in order for it to be effective. So those three aspects of looseness we think are relevant towards recognition technologies in HCI across the board. And we talk a little bit about this in the paper and I don't have time to go into detail here. But we also feel that it speaks to the notion of the H metaphor that's used a lot in autonomous or semi-autonomous systems such as self-driving cars. The metaphor being about the horse and the rider. The horse is the system that's more than capable of controlling itself and making decisions as it needs to. But the rider, through the control mechanism of the reins, is able to take degrees of control as and when they see fit. So in the paper, we offer some lessons as to how we feel our aspects of looseness that have um, emerged from this can relate to the application of the H metaphor and other recognition systems. And I'll finish up there and invite any questions. Andrew. <laughs> Hi, Andrew McPherson, Queen Mary University of London. Uh, thanks for this really interesting talk. Uh, it seems to me that this, uh, this idea of loose following, this kind of thing also would relate to a lot of uh, other work in score following in, yes. in other musical contexts. So I wondered if you've looked at combining this work in some way, either uh, contributing behaviors to existing score following algorithms based on your idea of music codes, or conversely, using existing score following algorithms as a, as a resource for looseness. Um, so the short answer is no, we haven't considered that, um, but I think it's a very interesting proposition. Um, one of the things I didn't mention in terms of our sort of um, aim and objectives with music codes, um, we, we considered score following right at the start of the process of developing the system, um, but decided not to go down that route as we wanted to enable musicians to choose as and when they wanted to synchronize with the system, if you like, which is something which doesn't necessarily fit well with the score following system that intends to be synchronized throughout the kind of the duration of a whole performance. Um, but in terms of your specific question, that's a great proposition. I think it's something that we need to think about. Um, I'm not sure at this stage I've got any more to say than thank you for the, um, for the idea. <laughs> any other questions? 